Good morning, church. Good morning to our Spain part, Jack Wars. We're glad to have the whole team, have, have the coaches here with us. Uh, we Football season starting here. It says a lot about each of you that you're here this morning. So we welcome them. Uh, if you have a copy of God's Word, we're in Genesis chapter 25 this morning, 26, 27, and 28. Genesis chapter 25 through 28. Rarely do I get in the vehicle, do I not pull out my phone and use it as a GPS. Uh, some of you have GPSs in your phone. Some of you, you're, you have a navigation system, but, but many of us use the app, whether it's Google Maps or Waze, and to get from point A to point B, you put in your current location, you put in where you want to go. And one of the things I love about that process is that if you take a right turn instead of taking a left turn, if you go one way instead of going the right way, what will occur is, is you'll see it recalculating. That, that no matter how far you get off the path that it has called you to, to travel, it can still get you to the destination. It might be longer, might be a scenic route, but no matter where you are, no matter how many wrong turns that you take, it can recalculate your destination to get you to where you need to go. Uh, we're studying the book of Genesis. Last fall, we looked at the story of Abraham. The fall before that, we looked at Genesis chapter 1 through 11. So two falls ago, we said Genesis act 1. Last fall, we said Genesis act 2. This fall, we're going to be in Genesis act 3, the story of recalculation. You see, God is really clear that he has a purpose for his people. He called a person by the name of Abraham to be the father of a great nation. And he promised Abraham that he was going to give him land and lineage, land and children. It is a long and windy road. And that long and windy road for God to keep his promises is filled with recalculation of God's children going off the path that he had called them to travel. But again, no matter how far they went off the beaten path, he had a way of bringing them back to his plan and his purpose. Do you know that for your life? Do you know that if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, that no matter how far you've gone astray from God's plan for your life and his purpose for your life, that the Holy Spirit desires to, to do a recalculation to bring you back into his will and to bring you back into his way, that no matter how far you travel in the wrong direction, you never get too far from home, that he can't bring you back. You don't believe me? Well, don't just take my word for it. The word of God in Genesis chapter 25 and 26 tells us a, a long and windy road story. And in that story, we discover the bridge on the road. His name is Isaac. Let me introduce you to Isaac. Isaac, for those of you that maybe aren't familiar, he's the son of Abraham. Let me tell you about Abraham. Abraham was a superhero of God's people. He, he was like larger than life on the story of the Bible. You, you find Abraham living in a land and a nation, and God saying to him, leave it all and go to the place that I'm going to show you. And, and, and he did that. I mean, he had that type of, of faith, this larger-than-life type of faith. More than that, there, there's a story, an Abraham story, where his nephew Lot gets captured. You know what Abraham does? He gets 318 mercenaries, 318 men, and he creates a own little army, and they go and find the captors, and they rescue Lot. That's the type of person Abraham was. He, he was a can-do kind of guy. He, he, he was larger than life. Isaac pales in comparison to his father. I, I, Isaac's rather passive in the biblical account. Isaac sort of repeats some of the worst mistakes of his father. There, there's a sense of deja vu. Abraham and his wife, Sarah, they could not have children. They finally have a son, Isaac, and it was after 25 years. And now the baton is being passed. Isaac, Abraham's son, is married to Rebecca. And guess what? They can't have children. It's a deja vu. And just in Genesis chapter 12, where God comes to 
Abraham and says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you land and lineage. You know the first thing that Abraham did? He's a superhero of a patriarch, but he was not perfect. No. Flawed he was, yes. The first thing that Abraham did after God came to him and said, land and lineage I'm going to give to you. There was a famine in the land and Abraham goes down to Egypt. And guess what? There are men who say, I like your wife. And he says to his wife, Sarah, tell them you're my sister because I'm going to die. And in Genesis chapter 26, it was like a deja vu story. God comes to Abraham's son, Isaac, says, I'm going to give you land, I'm going to give you lineage. And guess what? There's a famine. And guess what happens? The same thing that happened to Abraham. Now his son repeats. You read about it in Genesis 26, verse 6. Read with me. So Isaac settled in Gerar. When the men of the place asked him about his wife, deja vu, the same thing happened in Genesis 12. Listen to what the son said. He said the same thing, she is my sister, for he feared to say my wife, thinking lest the men of this place should kill me because of Rebekah, because she was attractive in appearance. Isn't it interesting that when Isaac is backed into a corner, he repeats the same mistake that his dad did. Uh, The details are different a little bit, but the same tendency that Abraham had when he was backed into a corner to choose not courage, but to choose cowardice, to not live in in the strength of the Lord, but the fear of man, so Isaac does it too. It's a principle that oftentimes when we don't recognize sin in our family tree, we don't confess that, we are ripe to repeat it from one generation to the next. All of us in this room have the consequences of sin. All of us in this room, the Bible said, have fallen short of God's standard, God's glory. And you know something? That's not just you individually, but that's every family that we come from. Every family has sins that so easily entangle that family. And one of the roles of fathers and mothers is to tell the story to tell the story of God's victory even in the midst of those sins that so easily entangle our family trees. I wasn't much of a football player by any stretch of the imagination, but football I did play. I was a quarterback. So seventh grade, eighth grade, junior high, play quarterback, go into the ninth grade playing quarterback, had a coach that was a huge influence to all the coaches that are here. What a tremendous influence that you have upon these men and to the coaches that are here, upon the ladies that God has given you the opportunity. I became a follower of Jesus because of Greg Stegall. You know who Greg Stegall was? He was my eighth grade football coach who invested in me and invited me to something called FCA. I said, Coach Stegall, what is FCA? He says, Eldridge, it doesn't matter, just come. And the first time I ever heard the gospel, the first time I ever heard it was in FCA. So this was, this was my issue as a quarterback. The, what I wanted to do as quickly as I could was to get rid of the ball, okay? <laughs> and seventh grade and eighth grade, that's okay. I, I had a one-read tendency. So three-step drop, five-step drop. I knew who I was going to throw it to before we broke the huddle. So I had my ninth grade coach, They said, Eldridge, if you're ever going to play on the high school level, you cannot just have a one-read option here. You've got to get at least to your second read, at least to your third read, because you are telegraphing every pass that you make. Now, this is what was interesting about what he did as he was coaching me. I heard that, but I still had that tendency. And I remember one time he took me to the side and he said, Eldridge, You know something, when I was 15 years old, I played quarterback. And when I was 15 years old, when I had a three-step drop or a five-step drop, my tendency was to do the very thing that you do. But this is what helped me get to my second read and my third read. And by him telling me a little bit of his own struggle, there was a sense of which I only could see that I wasn't doing what was right. But when I heard that that's the very same road that he had traveled. Now, we're reading between the lines here. We don't know. But why is it that Isaac repeats the same sinful decision that is beyond our imagination to say to his wife, 
That's my sister, not my wife, and put her in harm's way, just like his dad did. There is something about this story that is indicative of our tendency to repress the mistakes of our families. Oh, we don't talk about that. And what we repress and don't recognize and repent of, we are bound to repeat. All of us are coaches in one form. All of us as parents or all of us as individuals have a responsibility to make disciples of all nations. And God has given us in our life groups. He's given us in our families. He's given us the ability, especially as parents, to not flaunt those stories. But if you were to tap the family trees of all of us that are here, the sap that comes forth is nourishing sap. It's wonderful sap to admire and to be thankful for. But there are sins that so easily entangle every family tree. And there are times where a father must say, this is how I struggled with. And you fill in the blank. Lest it's repressed and repeated from one generation to the next. How has God provided a way of victory in our family trees must be a story that we tell, but it is a story that is first and foremost a vulnerable story to tell. So we tell not just the successes, but we tell those places of struggle and trial, lest the next generation not repeat our sinful tendencies. Notice the bridge in the road His name is Isaac. Notice also the bend in the road, Jacob and Esau. The story is of Rebekah, who desires to be a mother. Just like her mother-in-law, she cannot have children. Her story is two decades, 20 years of desiring to have children. And guess what happens? Jacob prays, and God answers that prayer two decades later, and she is pregnant with twins. I saw a viral video that was floating around. A mother has twins, and she embraces those twins, and you can see them resting upon her chest. And the first tendency of those twins are to reach for the hand of the the one that had been so close to them in the womb. They're, they're, They're locking hands because that's what they did in the womb. It's the first instinct. It is such a cute, cuddly, all sweet kind of story. This story is not a cute and cuddly twin story. I'm just going to tell you that. The story of Jacob and Esau is a story of sibling rivalry that starts in the very womb. Genesis 28, excuse me, Genesis 25, verses 21 through 22. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. The children struggled together within her. So they're jostling in the womb. And she said, this is Rebekah, if it is thus, why is this happening to me? God has to say, I've given not only you twins, but I've given you, Rebekah, two nations that are going to be at war with one another. And and the younger is going to be the one that eclipses the older. There's going to be a reversal here. And it is. They're born. The first one comes out. His name is Esau. Actually means red. If you were given him a nickname at school, he'd be Big Red. There's Big Red. He loves to be outside. He loves to hunt. He loves to fish. He is daddy's boy. Jacob comes out. You know what Jacob means? It means hill grabber. You know why it means hill grabber? Because what he was doing was he was grabbing the hills of his older brother as his older brother was being born. It also means deceiver. Why? Because that's his character. Deception, deceit, betrayal. It is there at the outset of Jacob in his very name. So Esau and Jacob, they do not like each other. And it comes to this sort of early crescendo when Esau, loved by his dad, Jacob, loved by his mother. One day Esau's out hunting. He comes home. He's famished. He's hungry. He's starving. He says to his brother who's in the kitchen and he's cooking, it's this big pot of stew. It's actually red stew. So the narrator of Genesis wants you to see red stew, the red man Esau. And Esau says, I need that now. I'm hungry now. And so Jacob says, because he's a deceiver, he says, I'll give you the stew, but you got to give me something. And you know what Jacob asked for? It, It doesn't seem like a big deal to us. He asked for his brother's birthright. Now, 
what does that even mean? What, what is important about that? Well, in that ancient Near Eastern world, it was everything. It was the right of the family inheritance. It was the right to be the leader. So in this moment, Jacob is saying, I'm the younger, but I want what is coming to you in your birthright. You know what Esau does? He says, sure. That stew, I'm going to die if I don't get something to eat. So impulsively, Esau trades what is his to get the temporary pleasure of the moment. And you say, what in the world does this have to do with my life? Well, as you travel that long and windy road, you know something? There are going to be times in your life where you're tempted to make impulsive, sinful decisions that give you a temporary solution with permanent consequences. Esau, by getting the stew... He gets a temporary solution that is ultimately going to have long-term, lifelong consequences. Satan, who is the ultimate deceiver, wants to whisper in all of our ears, make that compromise. It will mean nothing for tomorrow. Satan always wants us to see the immediate. He always wants to give us the illusion. But this is the thing about sin is, is while it looks appealing, it looks appetizing, it looks like it will fulfill us, it's always on the next day that we realize it will never fill us. It's a mirage. It's an illusion. As soon as we get to it, we realize it wasn't real. It can never keep its promises. And the temptation of teenagers in this room and the temptation of adults in this room and grandparents in this room is to believe the lie of Satan that our decisions do not have consequences. That's his lie. That's his strategy. Now, none of us in this room who are followers of Jesus can we lose our birthright in the sense that our birthright is a relationship with the Lord, forgiveness of our sins. But you know what we can lose? We can trade our witness to our lost friends and family members for the temporary pleasure of sin. We can trade the joy of the Lord for the temporary pleasure of sin. We, we can trade the peace of walking in intimacy with him for the temporary pleasure of sin. But notice, it is always temporary. It never will fulfill. It's always a mirage. It's always an illusion. Notice in this long and winding road, you have a bridge. His name is Isaac. You have a bend. That's Jacob and Esau. But I want you to see something that's really amazing in the story of Jacob and Esau. It comes to this moment where Jacob is not finished deceiving and betraying his brother. And we read about it in the encounter on the road. Look with me in Genesis 28. There are two times in the Jacob story where he encounters God in very memorable ways. But how we get to those encounters have really important significance for this story. Esau has been betrayed by his brother. He's given up his birthright impulsively. Another time, we come to this moment where his father Isaac is, is blind. He's losing his sight. Isaac, who's going to die, he's, he's of an old age. There's something about this image of him not being able to see. It's almost like Isaac can't see spiritually either. And so what Isaac has to do as a father is to bless Esau, his oldest, and to give him the blessing that he received to be the father of a great nation to have lineage and land that's going to be passed to Esau as Abraham passed it to Isaac. Now Isaac will pass it to the oldest. And in this moment, Rebekah, who favors the younger Jacob, hears the plan. Esau is told by his dad, go outside and go hunt and bring back something so we can eat together and celebrate. And in this moment, Rebekah calls her younger son over and says, this is your opportunity. This is your chance. Now, you've got to fool your dad, so you're going to have to dress up like him, and you're going to have to have hairy arms like him. And Jacob does it. He hears the words of her mom, his mom. He goes in before the dad, 
And the blessing that was supposed to go to his brother comes to him. Esau comes back in one of the saddest stories in all the Bible. He realizes that his brother has stolen not only his birthright, but he's stolen his blessing. And Isaac is overwhelmed realizing as Esau comes back that he didn't give his blessing to the one that he wanted to, Esau, but he gave it to Jacob instead. You know what Jacob has to do? He has to get out of town. You know what? The only comfort that Jacob's brother has is that Jacob's brother Esau wants to kill his brother. And I don't mean wants to fight with him. I mean he has homicidal pursuits in his eyes at this moment. So Rebecca says, hey, son, I've got a brother and he lives in Haran. It's about a one month journey for you. But that's the only place that you can go and actually live. So you have Jacob, who has deceived his brother out of his birthright and his blessing, and he is on this long and windy road going to a place called Haran. That place doesn't seem to have any meaning to us unless we're listening really closely to the story of Genesis, understanding that the last time we saw that was in Genesis chapter 11, when God came to Abraham and said, leave it all. Go to the land I'm going to show you. And you know the place they sojourned? You know the first place that Abraham gets to? Haran. So here is Isaac and Jacob. They're in God's holy land. The very promises of land are right there. And you know what Jacob's got to do now? Because he's deceived everybody. He's betrayed everybody. He's gotten off that road. He's got to rewind his life and his promises all the way back. He's going backwards in God's story. And in that moment, Jacob is all alone. There's nobody with him. He he doesn't even have an extra shirt to roll up to sleep on. He, he, He has to use a stone to go to sleep. That's how destitute Jacob was. And then we read this story. In Genesis 28, and he... Jacob dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. He's just a day into the journey here. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you. And if you want to underline something, if you want to circle something, you want to asterisk something, I will keep you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? There is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. Here, Jacob has a dream when no one is by him. No one is with him. He, he is literally at his rock bottom as he's sleeping on a stone. And in this moment, God comes to him. It isn't because Jacob's a good guy. He's not a good guy. It isn't because Jacob went searching for God. He didn't go searching for God. It isn't because Jacob wanted to be in the midst of God's will. The opposite is the case in this story. It's actually God's grace and his mercy that as Jacob has gotten far off the beaten path for his will and his way, God comes to him and verse 15 says, I'm going to keep you wherever you go. If you go all the way back to Haran, I'm going to be there with you. I think I was seven years old when I ran away the first time. I say first time sort of loosely. You need to know this. I I think when I was seven, while the details are a little sketchy, I think it had something to do with cookies that I wanted before supper that I could not get and so I had had it up to here so going into the first grade I got my G.I. Joe backpack and my Dukes of Hazard lunch box, lunch box and I loaded up with rations for a month long journey fruit roll ups and Kool-Aid 
uh, juice boxes and those kinds of things. And I told my mom, I announced to her, lest she know the weight of the consequences of her not allowing me to have what I wanted. I said, Mom, I'm running away. Off I go to the front door. Go down my road. I get to the first stop sign, sit down right there. It had to be four days, maybe five days that I sat there. I, I think it was probably like 24. Two minutes, actually, but I, I, I went through my rations, my fruit roll-ups, and, my, uh, and, and, and got the Kool-Aid boxes, and I thought I heard the sound of helicopters and search parties. I, I could feel that my family had been called in, and they were consoling my mother, so I ran back thinking to myself that there would be a party for me. The one who was lost was now found. They would kill a fatted calf, but you know something? Nobody, nobody was there. Like nobody said, David, I'm so glad you're back. I had to go find my mom. I ran away from her and I had to go find her. And I said to her, sort of in disgust, what kind of parent are, I just ran away. And she looked at me and she said, David, I could see you the entire time from the kitchen window. You didn't get that far. And so Jacob, Jacob's got to run away. I mean, life and limb is on the line here. But it's sort of God coming to him in this dream saying, no matter how far you run, you're never going to get out of the view that I have from the window of heaven. No matter your deceit, your betrayal, no matter that you're alienated from dad and brother, no matter that you're on the most wanted list of your brother Esau, I'm going with you. And I can bring you back to the very promised land that I have promised because my promises are not contingent upon your faithfulness. Do you know that this ladder, sometimes in the Hebrew, it's translated from Hebrew to English, it's translated staircase, stairway, stairway to heaven, a ladder from heaven. There's another time in the Bible where we get an allusion to this. Jesus is talking in John chapter 1 to Nathaniel. And out of all the stories that Jesus could tell, he tells this story in John 1 verse 51. And and it goes like this. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Okay, you want to check off all the things that Jesus has here? Jesus has heaven opened. Jacob saw that. Jesus has the angels and uh, descending and ascending. Check it off. But you know what's missing? What's missing? The latter is missing. The ladder is missing. But, but if you look closely, the ladder's not missing because the angels are ascending and descending. And you know who they're ascending and descending on? They're ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So what Jesus is saying is, is there was a day when Jacob went way out of the way. And I came to him and I told him that no matter where he went, I would be with him And I could bring him back to my purposes. And what Jesus is saying to all of us here, that guess what? We don't need a ladder. We have Jesus. He is the ladder. He is the way for us. No matter our sin, no matter our mistakes, no matter how far we get off of his path, he is is the way to a relationship with his father. Do do you know that? You know, we think of ladders as something we have to climb. You pull off a ladder when you've got to clean out the leaves in the gutter. You pull out a ladder when you've got to get to that nook and cranny that you need to paint on your house. 
And so we think of ladders as something we've got to climb. But notice in this ladder, Jacob's not climbing the ladder. Actually, the angels are descending from the ladder here. No man is going up because this is the truth of the gospel. The ladder has had one who has come down and his name is Jesus. And Jesus has descended to this earth so that one day with we, by faith, trust in him, we can ascend to heaven. Uh, Jesus said it this way in John chapter 14, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You know what Jesus was saying is, I'm the ladder. I'm the way that you can have a relationship with Almighty God. Now, what will Jacob say to that? What is Jacob's response to all of that? Well, let's save that. That's a little bit further down this long and winding road. But for this morning, my question to you is, do you know that he is the ladder? And do you know that you can have a relationship with a holy God no matter where you have been and what you have done when you place your faith in Jesus? Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your word. And we know that there are none of us in this room that haven't traveled off the beaten path, that there are times on the long and winding journey of our life where there are detours, we get distracted, we travel our own way, And to know that Jacob doesn't go looking after you. He doesn't try to pursue you. But in his worst moment, you pursue him. That's grace. And we thank you for your grace and your mercy that is initiated by your boundless love for us. I pray that there's not a person in this room that doesn't know the fact that they are loved by you and that they were loved by you in such a way that you would send your only son to be the ladder for us, to be the way that we could have a relationship with you. I pray that if there's anyone here today that doesn't know that truth, that they would talk to someone, that they wouldn't leave this morning without placing their faith in you, their Lord and their Savior. It's in your name we pray, amen.